All right, well, our text is relatively brief. It is the answer to the question from the scribe to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment um, in the law? And, of course, we know the answer to that, but let me go ahead and read that, Matthew 22, verse, verses 36 to 39. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And let me just say that I believe that this is the reason why we do see within Whitfield and every other saint of the Lord that is seeking to serve him why we see these things in them is because of this love. Now, I've already reminded you that last week we looked at the lives of John Wesley and George Whitfield, uh, focusing in the morning on a very important difference between them. Uh, Wesley believed that everyone to whom he preached the gospel had the ability to respond and to come to Christ. Now, Wesley knew the Bible teaches that we all come into this world fallen and wanting nothing to do with God because of Adam's sin as our representative and how Adam disobeyed him and how that corruption and sin has been passed down to us as well as the guilt of that, of that uh, first choice that Adam made. But Wesley also believed, and I think contrary to what the Bible teaches, that God gives a common grace that gives us or everyone who comes into this world the ability to choose Jesus when he is offered to us and that we will choose him if we just simply have a strong enough motive, if a strong enough motive is presented to us. And so as Wesley went out, he sought to present that motive. Now, George Whitfield uh, also believed that we are fallen and that we would never receive Jesus on our own. But he also believed that God, that God does not give a common grace to everyone, but a saving grace to some, the new birth. And once he does this, we will trust Jesus. We will turn from our sins. We will enter into his eternal kingdom. Now, we also saw that this conviction of Whitfield's, rather than discouraging him from evangelizing, which is what many who share John Wesley's view think it should, rather fueled it because he knew that when he called sinners to faith in Jesus and to repentance of their sins, that the Lord would open the spiritually deaf ears to hear and give sight to the spiritually blind to see so that they would come to Christ. He knew that what Jesus said to that you know, large group of people that were following him because they really enjoyed the, uh, the loaves and the fish all that the Father gives me will come to me. You know, that, that's the confidence that Jesus had. He knew that there was this body called the elect, his sheep, that the Father had given to him for his work, and he knew that they would come when the gospel was presented, and he didn't agonize over that. As a matter of fact, we don't really see, you know, Jesus concerned about that much at all because, again, he knew the Father would do this. By the way, that's our confidence as we go out to share the gospel. It doesn't depend on us. The only thing we really need to do is communicate the simple message. The results are in the Lord's hands. Now, having seen this difference, this morning I want us to focus on something that both John Wesley and George Whitfield shared in common. And that is they both had the blessing of the new covenant. The Spirit had written the law on their hearts he was working in them to make them like Jesus. And that's the reason why they, gave, they both gave themselves so completely to the Lord's work. Now, again, this, this is key, okay? Not that we love the Lord, but that we love him to this degree. Because we're going to see, our text tells us the degree to which we are to love him. It's the superlative degree. Now, we have this blessing, the same blessing that they had, if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are trusting in him alone for our justification. The Spirit then is also working this love in us to make us like Jesus, 
But again, if we would serve the Lord as they did, as Jesus did, okay, we, we must love him more because we're only going to serve him to the degree that we actually do love him. Now, first, we know that this is what motivated Jesus, okay? Jesus loved in the way that the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment call us to love. He loved his Father with, with his whole heart, with all the affection that he had within him, with every power of his soul, with every faculty of his mind. Mark adds to this list, by the way, strength, and Jesus did this as well. He loved the Father with all his emotional, spiritual, and physical energy. If we want to summarize this, we can say that he focused his whole being, Jesus did, on honoring and serving his Father. Okay, that's the degree of love that Jesus had. And we have to add to this that he also loved his neighbor as he loved himself. He treated them as he would be treated. He met the needs of, of everyone around him as he saw those needs. He healed the sick, uh, freed the demon-possessed, raised the dead, fed the hungry, and perhaps most importantly, preached the gospel to everyone he saw that they might escape God's wrath. Again, knowing that the Father would draw those that belonged to him to him. Now, in doing this, Jesus fulfilled the whole law. Jesus tells us in our text, on these two commandments depends the whole law and the prophets. This is what he did. Paul tells us love is the fulfillment of the law. If we love with the love of the Holy Spirit, we will do what the Lord calls us to do. But again, let's remember that Jesus did this not only because he loved the Father, it was in his heart to do this. He was an obedient son. This is what he would do under, under any circumstances. But he also did this in order that he might make us like himself. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, what the end goal of redemption is. Sometimes we think it is simply that we might be safe, we might be forgiven, we might be on our way to heaven, not have to worry about hell anymore, and then we just go on our merry way. But that's not what it's about. It is that we might become like him. Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew or foreloved and chose, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, the, the end goal of God's work of redemption is to make us like Jesus. Okay, not just in heaven, but also here on earth. And that's the reason why he gave us his spirit, so that the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us. Okay? Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, that is, as long as it's just written on stone, and we're looking at it and reading it, and that's all we have, okay, the law could not do anything for us, but what it couldn't do, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, this is not talking about Christ's righteousness simply being imputed or credited to us, accredited to our account. This is talking about the Spirit of God working in us to obey the commandments. It's that obedience that is the blessing of the new covenant. Again, remember the author to the Hebrews, he contrasts the old covenant people of God with, you know, and what, what things were like there with the new covenant, and he said that uh, I'm going to make a new covenant, not, not like the one that I made with them when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I didn't care for them. But, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." He's speaking about exactly the same thing that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 8, which is the Spirit of God is 
working in us to fulfill the requirements of the law. He is the one who is the writing of the law on our hearts because he gives to us this holy desire to live in this way. So as, you know, as before, the, the old covenant people of God who didn't have the blessing of the new birth were duty-bound to obey as we were when we came into the world. All of us are, are bound to obey God as by virtue of the fact he created us. Now it becomes our pleasure to obey him because we love him. Now when we look at the law of God, we don't say, I don't like that because it doesn't let me do the things I want to do. It doesn't let me sin. But I love those things because it doesn't let me sin, because these things are good and they're right and they are the things that I want to do. You know, this blessing of the Spirit, writing the law on the heart, is the only reason any have ever loved God. Remember, the, the work of Christ goes both directions. It goes into the future and it's reached us, but it also extends into the past. And anyone who has ever loved the Lord has loved him only because of the work of Christ. But we see that work in Enoch. It's the reason why he walked with God, because he loved him. And why God was so pleased with him that he took him early up to heaven when he was only in his 300s. You know, he didn't live to be into his 900s. But it's why Abraham uh, trusted God and was willing to give that which was most precious to him, his son, uh, as a sacrifice. Because he knew God would raise him up again if he allowed him actually to follow through with that sacrifice. This is why Moses... Uh, turned away from Egypt. We might look at that as an example of turning away from the world because Egypt was the best thing going in those days by the world standard, but he turned away from all those riches and that prestige in order to suffer with God's people as their deliverer, and that's because he desired God. Remember how he said on one occasion, I want to see your glory. That's, that's what consumed him. You know, he wanted to be close to the Lord and to see that which is the greatest of all beauties. This is the reason why Paul turned from persecuting Christ to preaching Christ. He writes to the Philippians in Philippians 3, verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Let me just suggest to you that this, I think George Whitfield could say the same. And I think John Wesley could say the same. They considered everything else as nothing compared to their desire to uh, know Christ, to serve Christ, to gain Christ. Now, if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this love because we really couldn't trust him unless we did but we will also give ourselves to him as well. Now, we won't do it perfectly. None of these men actually did it perfectly. We will fail in many ways, but that will be our heart. Now, we see in Scripture that this love, and again, here I'm going to apply it to you know, George Whitfield and John Wesley. But I think we would have to agree they spent time with God, they loved God, they worshiped God, they sought to live according to his will. But there is one thing that stands out about George Whitfield and John Wesley, and really all of the great saints that God has used who loved him uh, in the way we're called to love him. And that is they sought to bring the lost to faith in Christ. This is one thing that's common to all of them. Remember Jesus, obviously, went throughout all of Palestine looking for his lost sheep. The Apostle Paul traveled the entire Roman Empire searching for the lost sheep among the Gentiles. Uh, Martin Luther, after he discovered by God's grace the gospel, uh, began looking for those lost sheep among those that were in Germany and, and even beyond. John Calvin did as well. As we're going to hear this evening, George Whitfield crossed the Atlantic 13 times. I think... Um, Steve Lawson is going to tell us he spent three years of his life on a ship just, just crossing the Atlantic in order to find the Lord's sheep in the colonies. Uh, same is true of John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards and, of course, Charles Spurgeon. They spent their lives searching for those sheep as well. 
And really, all of God's people throughout the ages have spent their lives looking for them as well. This is what God's people do. They seek to fulfill the Great Commission. Paul writes to Timothy in, in um, excuse me, to Titus in Titus 2, verses 11 through 14, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, that is all kinds of men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And let me just suggest to you that the focus of those good deeds is the Great Commission. It is getting the gospel out to other people. It is living in such a way that we adorn the gospel by the way we live so that the witness we bring will be a believable one as we share the gospel, knowing again that Christ will gather his sheep to himself. So the, the, the point is if we want to serve more like Whitfield, more like Wesley, more like Jesus, okay, we need to love more like him. So again, I, I, the question we need to ask is how can we strengthen this love? Now, we know the answer to that question, but I'm going to remind us and maybe put some emphasis on something we don't often think about, but maybe we do. First of all, we need to pray, don't we? We need to pray. Whenever the apostles were faced with obstacles that might have caused them to sort of cringe under the fear of what might happen to them, they prayed for boldness. And what is that boldness? What is that courage? Where does it come from? Except a love that is stronger than the obstacle that stands in the way, a love for Christ, a love for the souls of men. We read in Acts 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now remember, this comes after they were released from the council where they were warned not to speak or teach, not to preach anymore in the name of Christ, and they said, we must. Okay, but obviously there's going to be a degree of fear that comes with that. So they prayed for boldness, and the Lord gave them that boldness. The Spirit filled them with a holy boldness, and I would say a strong and fervent love and zeal for God and for the salvation of souls that empowered them to push through any opposition. So we need to ask the Lord, first of all, for this same boldness, for the courage to overcome every obstacle. Now, we know that love is the strongest affection that is, that is in our hearts. And when our, our heart gets set on something, really there's nothing that can stop us from pursuing it. That's why we need a strong love, a love for the Lord, a love for souls, so that we might pursue these things in the way that we should, overcoming every obstacle, particularly our inhibitions, our, our fears, our, you know, afraid we're going to look like we're out of step, we're going to look like fools, or whatever we may think of. Um, we need a love that is stronger than those things, that will help us to overcome those things, that we might actually do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, secondly, we need to believe that when we pray for this, that God is going to answer that prayer and that he is going to give us that grace, that power. John writes in 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15, a passage that we often use when it applies to, you know, particular things that, that we might like to see, you know, and we should pray for a number of these things, praying for healing, praying for particular things that, that we may need personally. But we need to think of this, you know, in the context of what we're looking at. John writes, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now notice, according to his will. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Now the question we need to ask is, does he want us to be filled with the Spirit? Does he want us to be filled with this love? Is that his will? Okay. Well, Paul writes in Ephesians 
And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. That is a command. Does God want us to be filled with the Spirit? Yes. If we ask for that, will He do it? Yes. God wants us to be controlled, constrained by this holy zeal, by this holy love the Spirit of God gives us. And if we pray for this, He will give it to us. But remember, we need to pray wanting it. We, we must want to have this zeal and earnestly desire it. You know, the effectual prayer of a righteous man, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman or child who believe, belongs in Him belongs to him, will accomplish much, okay? So if we're not sincere about it, we can't really expect the Lord to, to answer that prayer. But if we are, he will. Now, thirdly, we do need to use the means, not only prayer, but also we need to meditate on the Word, spend time in the Word. Every day we need to spend time in the Word, and we'll see in a, in a moment a little bit more about what we're looking for. We do need to worship the Lord. We need to be faithful in that. We need to be faithful in fellowship, because, you know, these are the means that the Spirit of God uses to minister to us, to build us up in this holy love. Now, I've said a lot about that in the past, so I'm not going to focus on that. But fourth, we do need to keep Jesus in our minds and in our hearts continuously. First of all, we need to Bear in mind the example that Jesus gave us. This is very important, I think, to the power of the Spirit's working within our lives. Uh, we need to do what Jesus did, okay? Now, remember that Jesus' heart, His desire, His only desire, above everything else, was to do His Father's will. This was more satisfying to Him than His necessary food, this is the kind of strength of love that we need to seek. Now, we need to remember how that love worked itself out in his life. You know, the decisions that Jesus made on various occasions to do this or that, okay? When we are faced with any decision, we need to think about what Jesus would do if he were in our place. And we need to make decisions based upon that example to the very best of our ability, Okay, that, doing that is the same thing as yielding to, following, being led by the Spirit of God, uh, which is something we're called to do. And when we do that, it increases our love, obedience, yielding to the Spirit, making decisions that are honoring to Him, strengthens the work of the Spirit within us, strengthens His love in our hearts. And the converse is also true. When we make choices that are contrary to what the Spirit of God would have us do, contrary to what Jesus would do, when we fail, this grieves Him. It quenches His work in our hearts. It weakens our love for the Lord. And it makes it more difficult uh, to do what it is that we know we should do. And then fifthly, and perhaps most importantly, we do need to meditate on Jesus himself, okay? Not just his example. Who he is and, and what he has done for us in order that we might love him more. Remember, as Jonathan Edwards said, that um, uh, really uh, what the Spirit of God creates in us when he converts us to, to himself is he gives us a love, not just for God in general, but for something specific about God and that is his holiness. And of course, God's holiness is his love for what is good and, and right and his hatred of sin. Now, that's really what Jesus, when he comes into the world, shows us about God. Remember how the Bible says, how John tells us that Jesus came into the world to show us the Father, to exegete him, to explain him to us. When we see Jesus, when we see him doing what he's doing, making the choices that he's making, what we're seeing is the character of God, aren't we? We're seeing the Father. So that is what we ought to love, right? If the Spirit of God is working in us, a love for that holy character of the Father. When we look at Jesus, we should love what we see in Jesus. We should desire to Think about him and meditate on him. To think about 
how he loves and how much he loves. Think about how Jesus, again, loved the Father and pleased him in everything he did. We should find that desirable and, and something to be loved and coveted. How he loved us and gave himself for us. How he willingly condescended to become one with us. And how he lived in this sinful world and by doing what's right, suffered and died for us. How he continues to love us. How he intercedes for us from heaven and keeps us in his grace. How he is our only hope of heaven. Think about Jesus. Think about his character. Think about who and what he is. You know, we need to let what we see of him draw our hearts out to him. We need to let his love for us draw our hearts out to him to love him in return. Let me give you just a nugget from George Whitfield. He wrote this, study to know him more and more for the more you know, the more you will love him. And of course, you know, uh, as a corollary, the more we love him, the more we will do. Now again, doesn't reason show us the same thing? Those who don't love the Lord, they don't serve him. They don't do anything for him. Those who love the Lord a little, do little. But those who love him much, do much. The point is, we need to seek to love him more that we might do more for him because we will only do as much as we love. Well, may the Lord help us not just to hear this, but of course to act upon it and to do what is necessary because there are things we need to do, as we've just seen, in order to grow in this love. And we need to remember that and pursue that every day that we might love him more. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord uh, to help us do this, but also to prepare us to come to the table this morning as we remember the death of Christ. This is another means that God has given to us to grow in our love for him.